So hi, as she said, my name is Maria Davis. I'm a biochemistry and molecular biology major at Cornell College. And I'm Kara Middleton. I'm a senior biology major at Cornell College as well. Um, and since there's two of us, uh, you're going to get us for 16 minutes. So I'm going to So this past November, we had uh, the amazing opportunity to participate in a volunteer experience in Peru, uh, where we worked in the healthcare career. Um, and both Marie and I are extremely interested in pursuing a healthcare career uh, related to women's reproductive health or pediatrics. So we really wanted to travel to a different country, um, kind of see what it was like to uh, be in that profession, and then make comparisons between our experiences in Peru uh, with United States healthcare. So we decided to travel to Peru uh, through International Volunteer Headquarters and its partner organization, Maximo Novell. Um, and Maximo Novell set us up in a Peruvian home where we lived with five or six other volunteers who were working in different uh, programs, volunteer programs. So some of them were working in orphanages, others were doing conservation efforts. Um, so it was really great to be able to talk to them about their experiences too. Um, and why did we choose Peru? Uh, so we were given a list of options. I mean, as pre-med pre students, we don't have a lot of experience um, you know, in the healthcare field. And so we thought Peru was uh, an understaffed and under-resourced place that we could best utilize um, and help out in the clinic there. So specifically, Maximo Nivelle placed us in the Choco Health Clinic, which was about 20 uh, minutes by bus outside of Cusco. Um, this clinic uh, served the local village by providing health care uh, resources and uh, practices. And specifically, the clinic was made up of about five different rooms. It was really tiny. Um, there was the lab, there was the obstetrician and gynecology room, a pediatric room, the dentistry room, um, and then the uh, pharmacy, and then there was this tiny little office that they used as their doctor's office. It was really interesting. So in um, the top picture, you can see the lab. And that microscope in the picture is their most um, advanced technology in the lab. So that was amazing to us coming from a college where we have lots of different things. Um, that was like the most advanced thing that he had. Um, he made do with every little bit of, um, every little piece he had in his lab um, to do the tests that they needed to get done for their patients and they would outsource if they needed um, more advanced technology to be used on those tests. Um, in the toddler picture, you can see two nurses doing some paperwork. They had one computer in the entire clinic, and um, it was only used rarely by the doctors. Otherwise, everything was done by hand. They wrote everything, and um, they were very good at keeping their paperwork straight, and it just took them a really long time to get things done. This um, other picture was the essence of the pediatric room, it was just a tiny little changing table. Uh, that's about all they had. It was, um, they measured the babies there, they did everything that they needed. And then this is their amazing filing system. That just is amazing to me that they could keep everything straight, they knew exactly where everything was and could immediately get it. And it was just in the little hallway between all the buildings. So what did we do while we were uh, working in this clinic? Uh, we had the opportunity to shadow um, several physicians. Um, as I mentioned before, Marie and I are both extremely interested in women's reproductive health. And so primarily we spent the majority of our time with Isabel, who was the OBGYN in the clinic. Uh, but we also did have the opportunity to help out and shadow Marco, who was the laboratory technician, as well as some nurses um, in the pediatric department. And so uh, the physicians and patients both spoke Spanish and Quechua, which is a dialect of Spanish um, in that region. And so prior to this experience, uh, Maria had taken some high school and college courses um, on Spanish and had basic conversational skills. As, my, as for myself, I had never taken a Spanish class in my life. Um, so this was definitely one of the more challenging aspects of our work because we really wanted to be able to communicate with physicians and patients and learn about their health care. Um, so Marie and I both studied really hard. Uh, we tried to learn medical terminology. We would bring three or four Spanish-English dictionaries to work with us every day in order to flip through them. Um, if worse came to worse, we played charades with physicians to try to figure out what, what we wanted to say to them. Um, 
And as I mentioned before, uh, we don't have a lot of experience in the healthcare field, and so we couldn't, you know, give vaccinations or draw blood. That'd probably end up horribly. Um, but we did assist with basic duties. Um, we took the height and weight and blood pressure of patients in the clinic. Um, so here are just some pictures of us performing basic tasks that they needed help with. Uh, we also completed this volunteer program for academic credit, and as such, we were required to keep daily journals about our interactions with physicians and patients, maybe uh, discuss any questions that came up during the day or things that we wanted to ask them at a later time. Uh, we also conducted two interviews uh, with staff members at Choco Clinic, and so we chose to interview Isabel and Marco uh, just about their educational experiences, um, how they got to their profession, what things they liked and didn't like about their job. And then lastly, we also uh, compiled critical research reviews, um, or research paper on a topic of our choice, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, so this wasn't part of our uh, volunteer placement per se, but Marie and I were really interested in checking out a local hospital to see how healthcare there differed from uh, the healthcare that was being administered in the small clinic that we worked in. Um, so on the right are just some pictures of the exterior of, um, of the hospital. Um, the top one, I don't exactly remember what that building was, but this bottom one was the leukemia department. And here is an image of uh, inside the department. And one afternoon we actually had the opportunity to uh, play with leukemia patients, which was really cool. Alright, um, so we were able to take what we learned and compare it to um, the experiences we have had here. Um, in the United States, job shadowing or doing internships in the hospital setting. So obviously the first thing we notice is their technology is completely different. As I said before, they had one computer. They copied everything, and they didn't even copy them for just themselves. They gave their patients a copy of every information that they had, and so their patients had this, the resources as well as they kept for their files. Their resources and supplies, as I said, were pretty limited. Um, Karen and I actually took some supplies with us, just some basic gloves, some masks, and some hand sanitizer, and they were utilized the very first day. Marco, the lab technician, was supposed to use one pair of gloves the entire day for every sample he was running. So it didn't matter if he was doing 10 blood samples, he had five feces samples, you know, six urine samples, he used the same pair of gloves the entire day because that's all he was able to use, and to protect himself he had to do that. He washed his gloves a lot, but Still, you know, a new pair of gloves each time is what we're used to, so that was definitely something different. Um, we took TB masks um, to help, which TB is very prevalent in Peru, so we took some with us, and that was also utilized the first day we were there. Um, they used them right up, and hopefully they lasted a little bit. Um, the doctor-patient relationship was one of the most intriguing things to us. It didn't matter who came in, but Isabel would spend as much time as she wanted with the patients. Um, she didn't have like 15 minutes that she had to get in and out really quick. She would, you know, spend five minutes with a person if that's what the person needed, or she'd spend up to an hour with the person if that's what they needed. And this wasn't just, you know, providing medical um, support and knowledge. She would, you know, talk to them, make sure that their life was going well, um, help them if they needed in other, any other ways in their life. Um, one patient came in and she actually had a miscarriage, and so Isabel spent about an hour with her just you know, helping and counseling her, talking her through things, and just letting the woman um, deal with some of those issues. The wait time was another thing. It was kind of like um, an urgent care clinic. They just, they knew what day they were supposed to show up to the clinic. They would just show up, and then they would wait in line. They got a number. And it was kind of a, a social opportunity for all of them as well. The first day we walked up, there was all these people that were outside the clinic, and I, was, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'm like, why are they all outside? Well, they were just waiting patiently to see the doctor or the, do the nurses, and they just would like have social time with their neighbors and friends, and that was something we thought was really interesting. Um, the cost, essentially, this was a free clinic for all the people in the village. They all fell into um, a financial bracket in which they could have free health care um, provided by the government. Unfortunately, the clinic itself was not really reimbursed very well by the government, so it was expensive for them to maintain as well. And then the last thing was there was essentially no confidentiality um, that existed. There would be a woman sitting with Isabel, like in this picture, and then someone else would just kind of barge in the room, ask Isabel a question that they had urgently, and then leave. And this happened on numerous occasions every day. You know, they didn't sign away their life to HIPAA like we do every time we go to the doctor. Um, 
so it was just a lot more of a laid back environment and um, yeah, we thought that was really interesting. So aside from noting cultural differences inside a healthcare setting, uh, we also had the opportunity to travel a lot on the weekends uh, since we didn't have to be at the clinic. Uh, so we went on a lot of weekend excursions. Um, this picture here is of uh, other volunteers that we lived with. Um, and like I said before, they were from all over the world. Um, there was one girl from England, some from Canada, one from Australia. And so it was really great to uh, talk about their experiences in their own countries as well as their work uh, in Peru as well. Uh, we had the opportunity to try some really interesting and great food. Uh, this is a picture of ceviche, which is fish marinated in lemon juice and spices, which is really good. Um, here's kind of a typical uh, tourist entree. It's called koi, which is actually guinea pig. Um, and it's, it's better than you'd think it'd be, actually. Uh, not a lot of meat on the rodent, but it was really good. Um, this is a picture that was taken of a woman at a textile factory. Uh, and she was describing how they dyed uh, alpaca yarn uh, using natural ingredients. Uh, one weekend we took a trip to Puno and stayed on floating islands. Um, and these were on Lake Titicaca. And we were pretty popular with a lot of the natives. They wanted to take pictures with us. Uh, here's a picture of us at Marai, which was an Incan archeological site. And then our last weekend there, we actually had the opportunity to go to Machu Picchu and then climb up Huayna Picchu as well, which is in the back. So as Kara previously stated, um, there was some academic requirements here. Um, we conducted, we didn't conduct our own research, but we did research reviews on the topic of our choice. And um, one of the first days I was able to go out with some of the nurses and help them as they distributed vaccines throughout the village. And so this kind of sparked my interest in looking at um, what Peru is doing to decrease the child mortality rate in Peru. So just a little bit of background, since the early 1990s, actually Peru has had um, economic um, growth and they have seen a 23% decrease in poverty, which is a factor that definitely plays into decreasing this mortality rate. Um, they are projected to reach the fourth millennium um, development goal by 2015, which is very good. Um, this is decreasing their childhood mortality rate, which is between ch children between the ages of zero and five by um, two-thirds the rate it was in 1990. And we've already seen um, a decrease by 76% since 1990, so they're well above um, the goal, so we're projected to reach that. Um, one of these factors that I looked in was increasing the use of vaccines. And Peru has done a significant job in increasing um, vaccines that are being distributed to children. And um, those are just some typical vaccines that we receive here, um, maybe not yellow fever, but the rest of them. And in about the early 90s, they were about a little less than 70%, and now the rates of children uh, receiving them are almost up to like 90, past 90, some are at almost 100%, which is really um, something that can help prevent from diseases that they um, could get and just pre preventing them. And um, but one of the biggest things that I noticed was that human efforts is the most important aspect of decreasing this rate. Um, increasing education of parents and people receiving the vaccines, access to proper health care, so taking these vaccines out to the village and giving them to people instead of making them come to you, as well as these innovative programs that they're initiating, such as um, vaccine days and other big pushes to um, make sure the resources out there for people. So through my conversations with Isabel, who again was the OBGYN in the clinic, uh, we talked a lot about women's reproductive health issues. And so one of, the, one of the things that really piqued my interest uh, was abortions in Peru and how this is affecting women's health. Uh, so abortions are illegal in Peru unless uh, the uh, pregnancy is a threat to the health or life of the mother. And um, the reason for this is that the majority of Peruvians are practicing Roman Catholics. Um, so despite the fact that abortions are illegal in Peru, they have one of the highest clandestine abortion rates in Latin America. Uh, so 52 per 1,000 Peruvian women uh, have had an abortion compared to 29 per 1,000 uh, women in other Latin American countries. And as a consequence of this, approximately 30% of induced abortions end in medical complications. And this is because women cannot seek the help of licensed physicians. Uh, if, it's, if a physician um, it helps out and gives an abortion to a woman, they can actually lose their license. 
And so women are resorting to really harmful methods of inducing abortion, such as um, inserting blunt objects into their vagina, ingesting toxic liquids, uh, sometimes they overdose on drugs, or also uh, they can seek the help of untrained individuals. And so um, despite all of these negative aspects, um, there really haven't been any changes in law uh, to help out uh, this aspect of women's health. So where do we go from here? Well, as Kara said previously, we're both um, aspiring professionals in the medical world and hopefully attending medical school. We are specifically interested in women's health care um, and as well as pediatrics. And so we just, this gave us an oppor opportunity to see something outside of the classroom in our, in our textbooks. It also gave us ex um, experience in a healthcare setting and um, learning about things that they do, but also giving us the perspective that it's somewhere else outside the United States and how they deal with their limited resources and how they provide patient care. And the last thing is just this cultural awareness and appreciation. I think this provided both of us with an experience to work with people we had never met, a new culture, learning to adjust, deal with challenges, and something we can definitely take into us, um, back with us, into our um, professional settings in the future. Thank you very much.